Well, welcome all. My name is Seth Green, and on an afternoon like this one, I'm especially grateful to say that I'm the Dean of the Graham School here at the University of Chicago. And I will virtually welcome you to our gorgeous campus, which is every bit as beautiful as it looks here with a little bit of haze added, although not nearly the haze that I believe other cities east of us are getting these days. Uh, and I share this photo, even though this is an online gathering, just to situate you in the big ideas and the context of this grand university. Uh, welcome as well to the Graham School. And that is the first item on our agenda is we wanna tell you a little bit about the University of Chicago Graham School. Then we will get started with this program and talking about why we decided to develop it. And then I'll be turning it over to Stephanie and Russ Eisenstadt, who are the instructors and visionaries behind this to offer a program snapshot. And then we'll be turning it over to my colleague, Michelle Libby, who will talk about the application process. And then most importantly, we will come to your questions as we're really eager to answer them and ensure that you leave here, not just with more information, but with anything that you're curious about in specifics answered. So let me start with an introduction to the University of Chicago Graham School. And for those of you who are not familiar, we are the destination for rigorous lifelong learners who seek to better understand the world and to live examined lives of purpose. And we have been at this mission now for more than 130 years. We're actually one of the three founding divisions of this great university because when William Manny Harper was setting up this university with John D. Rockefeller, their objective was to revolutionize university study in this country. And one way they approached that was saying, we don't just want the ideas of this university to be stuck within our walls. We wanna bring education to people at all ages and stages of life. And that actually began in 1892 when we began offering the first evening courses for, and I quote, men and women whose daily occupation didn't allow them to participate in the usual life of this university. And so this is a very proud part of our founding as a university. And to this day, we continue to be trailblazing new paths in lifelong learning. And we have four main portfolios in which we engage in lifelong learning. The first is a Master of Liberal Arts, which is a rigorous degree program where you can study across the different arts and sciences of the university. We have a basic program where you can immerse yourself in this rigorous great books program. We have lifelong leadership, which is about developing your skills to lean on later in life. And then we have open enrollment where you can take classes across the university's disciplines. And the reason I wanted to share that is because this piece of our work, creating your next chapter, is part of that broader leadership in life that we are very focused on as we help people to live examined lives of purpose. And so I'll start by acknowledging that the origin of this particular program really began with a recognition that people are living longer. And increasingly, people are reaching the end of their primary career arc with decades remaining for purposeful leadership. Indeed, if you reach 60 today, there is a majority chance that you will reach 90. And if you reach 60 at a certain level of education and income, that number can go up to as much as 75% predictability. And so the result of that is that we are in a time where many people are still kind of coming in their mid to late career to a point where they are finishing that act that they've been a part of for three or four decades, but they are not ready to just retire. They really wanna rewire and have a whole new chapter of purpose in their professional and personal lives. And especially because we don't have scripts for this, because longevity is a relatively recent phenomenon, it often requires a whole new set of discernment. And of course, as a university, discernment is our middle name, and we love being a place where people can really imagine in the context of reflection and looking at how people across time and space have answered similar questions. So what we did once we realized that this longevity was creating a whole new chapter of life is in October of 2022, we brought together 250 scholars, practitioners, and accomplished executives to think about what does it look like to build programs for people to make these transitions 
successfully and purposefully. And that included an immense number of thought leaders. And I'll just show you um, a few of those uh, who were part of this gathering. And after that, we decided we wanted to have a really deep program that would be in residence in Hyde Park. And that would be a year long fellowship where people who really want to take a deep discovery approach to figuring out their next chapter could get all of those high touch resources around them to embark on a really meaningful next act. And that's called the Leadership and Society Initiative. And that's at a university level involving all of the schools and divisions of this university. And that excitingly will launch with an extraordinary first cohort in September. At the same time, we also learned that there were many people who were not in a position to commit full time for a year to a program to discern their next chapter, but who really wanted these resources, maybe because they're currently in their career and they want to think about this transition five to 10 years in advance. Maybe because they're already at that point where they're getting ready for retirement, but they have other commitments from a family or life perspective that keep them from being in Chicago or keep them from being able to commit that kind of time. And so we heard from this group that gathered that a small portion would be the right fit for this deep discovery process. And there is a much broader group who might really value a similar set of tools delivered in a much shorter format and in a way that could be better integrated with their lives so that they could really embark on this at a different age and stage. And that is the origin of crafting your next chapter. And we say it's designed for you if you are in mid to late career with two or more decades of professional experience, you are willing to engage in really deep, rigorous, and respectful open exchange because so much of this is not just about knowledge transfer, it's really about knowledge co-creation with one another in a shared space. And if you have an eagerness to develop your vision for a meaningful next chapter, but you don't know exactly what that looks like yet. And so with that, I want to turn it over to the two extraordinary people that we identified to help us imagine what this program, Crafting Your Next Chapter, could look like. Russ and Stephanie Eisenstadt are co-founders and partners in Rising Path Partners. Uh, they each have a very extraordinary background, as you saw in advance in the materials. Uh, Russ has a, an extraordinary role where he was the head of the Center for Higher Ambition Leadership, and prior to that, a faculty member at Harvard Business School, wrote a number of outstanding books that really helped to look at how people live higher purpose lives. Uh, Stephanie Eisenstadt is a physician educator and someone who has been part of the healthcare system in leadership for years and then has come over now to this role of coaching and helping others to discern their next chapters as well as continuing uh, that work in healthcare. And so with that, uh, let me turn it over to them and. Uh, Russ and Stephanie, the, the floor is yours. And then after their presentation, uh, we'll come back to talk about logistics and then we'll come to your questions. It's great. So, Seth, thank you. This is such a pleasure to be here. Um, and it's very exciting to have an opportunity to be connecting with everyone today. And let me just get my, can folks see my screen? Oh, Yes. This is the yeah. this is the tough part, which is the technology. But <laughs> thank you, excellent, perfect. So um, what Steph and I wanted to Stephanie and I wanted to do today was to again take a little bit of time to talk about, and this is really picking up on some things that Seth has already touched on, kind of reframing how we think about the second half of our lives, in and and really what is the opportunity for for each of us as we think about that and then and then dive um in into more detail into a an overview of the course and and particularly give you a preview of some of the thinking some of the core questions we're going to be exploring together giving you a chance to get um dip your toe in the waters in terms of exploring some of the, those questions even right now um as we move forward so um, let, let me start. Let me start by sort of sharing, uh, making this a bit personal. Um, you know what I found over the last years um, is that 
uh, people in my life started asking me very different kinds of questions. And this was professional colleagues, um, it was friends, and it was even even our kids. And, you know, the kinds of questions I started getting are things like, how does it feel to be approaching the Social Security years? Oh, okay, <laughs> interesting. How, how, how is your health holding out? Um, what are you doing with all that room now that your kids are out of the house? And, you know, are you guys moving? And you, you, do you want to go someplace warm and so on? And have you taken up golf yet? And then, and then ultimately sort of leading to, you know, when are you planning on retiring? And they were interesting questions and I understood why people were asking them, but there was also sort of spoke to something that didn't quite fully resonate for me. They really weren't the questions that Stephanie and I we're asking ourselves uh, questions we really we found ourselves asking were somewhat different, which is, you know, how do you think about as you move into the second half of life? And as Seth highlighted, you know, you think about a hundred year life, age 50 plus, this isn't just age after age 65, but really after age 50 to say, you know, how, how do we think, how can we aspire to something other than just getting older? Um, at this stage of the game, how do we more fully leverage our capabilities and talents? How do we find meaning and purpose in this next chapter? Um, which are a really powerful set of questions. And I think, as Seth highlighted, I think different than as a culture in the society, the ones that typically um, and historically have gotten asked at, at, at this stage. Um, and part of, you know, I think what, what as we thought about this, part of the issue and the challenge is that a realization that for all of us, our views of the latter years of our life are shaped by the examples and the models that we have in life. And, you know, as I reflected on that for myself, the models that I had of what it meant to get older were very much my grandparents. And this is a picture of my uh, grandfather, Sam, and, and his wife, Bessie. Um, and this is in the early 60s. And, you know, he, he, there was nothing he wanted more than the opportunity to truly retire, to be able to sit on a rocking chair and take it easy. You know, he was a, a paper boy in the Lower East Side. He got up at four o'clock in the morning. And by the time he hit the 60s, he really was, was at a very different stage in his life. And that made a lot of sense and it had a lot of integrity, but it wasn't necessarily a path that made sense for me. Um, Stephanie had a different experience and different set of models. Steph, you want to talk about your grandmother? Sure, thank you and hello everyone. Uh, so Nancy, my grandmother, uh, who was an artist, chose a di much different life path and her husband died when she was age 60 and she really had to rethink her life. And she found that she could connect her art with travel and community. And so here she is on an archeologic dig in Tanzania, Africa. And following this, she decided to live with the Maasai tribe for three months. And then she used the experience to create her art, which were serographs, and then continued the rest of her life traveling around the world and having these living experiences in different places. In contrast, my father, Philip, uh, had more of a traditional road to retirement. And as an organic chemist, he worked in R&D in, a, in a, uh, a division of a large corporation that had mandatory retirement at age 65. And whether you were ready or not, you know, he had no choice and he was retired. And he did struggle with this. So some of us have choices and others do not. And given the current economy and financial constraints, some of us need to keep working and keep revitalizing. And so the average age for retirement in the US for all workers has been rising and used to be around age 57. Now it's up to age 62. For uh, us physicians, it actually had been uh, more traditional to retire at a later age, average around age uh, 68. And many of us worked into our late 80s um, but now post COVID, you know, all people are, are kind of reevaluating and reassessing their options. And with the changing healthcare landscape in particular, the average age of retirement for physicians is now age uh, 65. And with a third of the physicians now over the age of 60, 
the trend is resulting in a physician shortage. So there's a, a fair amount of impact of our choices. Russ? So, you know, one thing to reflect on, and you may just think about for yourself, what are the models that you carry in your head? You know, if you think about your parents and your grandparents, what were the models you saw? What were the models that in some sense you want to emulate and the things that really um, resonate and, and, and those that, that don't for yourself? We found that to be a, certainly a powerful source of reflection. So again, you know, the question becomes, how do you think, what do you see, you know, young or old, what do you see? And um, I, I, I love this as sort of a gestalt picture. You know, do, do you see the old, the old lady or do you see the young woman, you know, with a bonnet, right? And, and in many ways, perception is, 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 is reality. Um, and so, you know, this then becomes the question, sort of how in a deep way are we, you imagining your future years unfolding um, and, and thinking about that going forward? Is it about slow decline or is it really about an opportunity for re re renewal and reinvention? Um, and again, you know, part of this is, I think, for all of us is going past a traditional view of what a life is about, you know, historically, um, it was very simple, right? There were three stages, childhood and adolescence, this long sort of plateau of adulthood, um, not necessarily an assumption that there was a lot of growth or development, but, you know, you did what you had to do, and then this rapid decline in, in, in old age. And, you know, by the way, this is not a new view or a mindset. Um, there's a there's an, some of you may be familiar with uh, the riddle of the Sphinx. This is Oedipus on the road to Colonus, and um, he runs into a Sphinx, and the Sphinx says, if you get it right, you know, you get the riddle right, you get to uh, get into the city. If you don't, um, I'm going to eat you. And there were a number of bones around and so on. And so the question um, he asked was, what walks on four legs in the morning two legs at noon and, and three legs in the evening. And I'm going to pause for a second. Um, if anyone knows the answer or even can guess, maybe you put it in chat um, and see if we've got some folks who are uh, good at riddles here. Well, so Deborah, so are we getting any? Being. Uh, Terrence says a man, Angela says a human, Michael says a man. I think, I think our audience is quite intelligent. <laughs> That's great. We, we clearly have some classical scholars here. So um, exactly. The, the answer is, is it, 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 uh, are humans, human beings, right? We, we walk on all fours in the morning, we, we stand on, on two legs in the evening, and, 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 in the, and we walk with three legs in the evening. But again, you see sort of those three, those three, um, those three chapters. Um, and so, as Seth highlighted, you know, all of that changes as you think about increased life expectancies. Um, and what's more than just life expectancies is it's not just lifespan, but it's also health span, right? It's the ability to live in a way that's healthy and with your facilities and so on. And that's also increasing in, in dramatic ways. So, you know, I think what's important here, and this is, a, um, I, I think, a, a wonderful it's a wonderful book by Mary Catherine Bateson called Composing a Further Life, a lot of wisdom. Um, and one of the things she says, which I, I find resonates with me, is um, we, have not, we have not added decades to life expectancy by simply extending old age. Instead, we have opened up a new space partway through the life course, a second and different kind of adulthood that precedes old age. And as a result, every stage of life is undergoing change. And so what that leads to, if you sort of think about what a different way of thinking about the, the arc of a life is that, you know, in addition to just childhood and adulthood and old age, it's interesting. I mean, one of the things that a lot of the research, there's a great book called The Hundred Year Life that highlights this as well, is that it's not just in this period um, after age 50 that things are changing, but also early in careers, so um, the 22 to 30 plus period, you know, what we're finding is people are getting married later, they're having kids later, they're really exploring more because there's more time. And it's something I have to remind myself with my kids to say, okay, settle down already, move on, you know, but in fact, um, that's a very natural and a natural consequence. Um, and 
but the phase that we're really focusing on in this course and in the program is that late career 50 to 75 plus period, which we call kind of rewirement, which is an opportunity to rebalance, revitalize, reimagine work and life, um, and, and to look at some different ways and, and, and paths forward. Um, and so, you know, what I'd like to share with you a little bit, we've, um, as Stephanie will talk about in, in a bit, we've been uh, teaching this program for um, the last years with physicians at the Mass General and with other folks, and we've been finding um, some, there are really some key themes that come up around the challenges and opportunities, and also looking at, at the research as you think about the second half of life. Um, and the first point I want to make is that, you know, in fact, there really is this interesting break in the middle between the, that, in fact, the, the opportunity starts really in midlife, but there is this interesting break point when you leave full-time employment, which, you know, plus or minus is around 65, and then things change again at 75 plus or minus. Um, and, you know, if you think about kind of what happens over that period, at one level, um, there's an increase in freedom, right? For a lot of us, our kids are no longer in the house. Some of the things that uh, were wonderful, but also very much defined our lives. We have more freedom, but also uncertainty about what we do with that time. We don't necessarily need to be working full time in the way we were. Lots of people talk about how, you know, the choices were made for them. Now there really is choice. Um, the second thing that, that Excuse me, I'm having a, a uh, excuse me, it, it is an awareness of mortality. Um, and even if we're healthy, it's hard to get into your 60s without seeing people around you who are, who are not uh, doing well. And an awareness that, look, well, time is limited, that there really is an opportunity to do something different, different with one's life. Um, and that then leads to a set of challenges. You know, what we hear from people who are still working is, am, am I still relevant? Um, what's the contribution I still have to make? Is there an opportunity for renewal for myself at work and the things that I'm doing? And then after people leave full-time employment, um, th there are a set of very predictable challenges that people face around identity. If my identity has always been around my role as a, as a physician or as a, a, a business leader or a, a professor, uh, who am I, what am I, what do I say, you know, what's my elevator pitch when I go to a, a, a party to explain to people who I am and what am I doing? What's my purpose? What's the value added that I'm providing? What's the community? And, and the, so much of the connections we have are at work. How do we start to replace that for ourselves? But there's another piece to this, and I think this is really the opportunity, which is one of the things that we also find is that as people get older, um, that in fact, there's a great deal of research that suggests that our emotional intelligence or ability to recognize patterns, to, to see things in a way that really take advantage of the years of experience increases and in something that one might call wisdom, which really creates an opportunity um, to really think about life and, and the opportunities in front of us in different ways. Um, and that's an opportunity if you think about not just after we leave work, but, but even for those who are still um, in, in the workplace, um, you know, there's a need for us individually to continue to grow and develop, to revitalize, to be mentors, to leave a legacy. Um, Organizationally, there's an opportunity as well. Um, and if you think about organizations and thinking about dealing with those of us who are over 50 and, and over 65, the need to retain institutional capabilities and, and the wisdom, to avoid people simply um, retirement in place, and, and to take advantage of the mentorship and ability to pass the baton to the next generation. And so there's really an opportunity, I think, you know, for those of us who are still working to think not just about, you know, when do I leave full-time employment, but how do I think about the work that I'm doing potentially in, in organizationally in, in, in a different kind of a way. And so where that takes, takes us to it in more broadly is to say, look, um, 
there really is this opportunity in midwife not to see this as crisis, but actually as increased opportunity. And if you look at life satisfaction, it's interesting that, in fact, the low point for satisfaction, in fact, and this multiple studies have shown this, is actually around age 50. Um, and after age 50, in fact, there's, there's an upward slope. And the opportunity, and I think this is what Stephanie and I are excited about, is to engage and partner with you around capturing that upward slope um, in, in, in terms of creating an opportunity uh, for your life and, and, and your work. So how do you know you're ready to rewire? You know, I think, again, back to Mary Catherine Bateson is a wonderful quote. You know, she says, when you reflect that you've done much of what you hope to do in life, but it's not too late to do something more and, 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 and different. Um, and that's really the promise and the opportunity. So I'm going to turn this over to Steph, Stephanie to talk a bit about the actual program, having kind of created a little bit of the context. Steph, over to you. OK, thank you. Well, so the, as Ross mentioned, the program was initially developed and refined at the Massachusetts General Hospital, which is an academic medical center in Boston affiliated with Harvard Medical School. And the course was designed for mid-career to senior, of senior mid-career seat to senior physicians and also PhD uh, researchers. And you know what we were finding as we were uh, reflecting on our career is the lack of re internal resources to, uh, to allow people to have the opportunity to really reflect and think about this. So our class was uh, quite diverse. Some were taking on new work roles and academic roles mid to late career. Others wanted to redesign their current uh, situation post COVID since so much organizationally had, had changed. And some wanted to achieve a better work-life balance, some downsizing, others finding themselves at a transition point, including full retirement that they did not anticipate. And then others just wanting to explore the world uh, beyond MGH, beyond Boston and, and what they could do with their various capabilities and talents. So uh, the participants about, we had them uh, complete a survey, a pretty extensive survey, and 100% of the uh, participants said they'd recommend the course uh, to other people, and that the over, overall course rating was around 4.7 out of 5. The course offering here that we're going to do uh, through the University of Chicago will be eight virtual sessions, and we, we're going to do it two hours uh, every other week. Uh, except there's one week between the last two sessions so that we can get done by Christmas because we don't want this running into the Christmas holiday. And the course is a guided journey grounded in a long history of research in the fields of lifespan development and positive psychology. And it includes self-reflective exercises, uh, provocative readings, large and small group work, peer-to-peer -peer support, individual coaching. And we're uh, hoping that uh, the class, uh, we usually limit it to uh, 24 students so that we can uh, maintain the uh, safety and intimacy of the group. Next slide, Russ. So nothing tells you more about a course than participant feedback. And so we thought that this quote was particularly salient. Some of us are just starting, others are near an abyss, with others have fallen in and trying to crawl their way out, some standing on the other side with others walking towards the light. But all of us have benefited from this kind of learning experience, the diversity of perspectives and the community. Russ, next slide. So we've organized the course into three sections, reframe, revitalize, and then reinvent. So to start with reframe, well, that is testing your assumptions about your future. Could it be different than we're currently imagining? Next is revitalize. How do we harness our energy and re-energize our current life and work? And it's important to have some, some structured reflective time to take stock on where you are now, learn from your history, understand what it takes to get into a growth mindset, what your strengths are, how to fully apply your strengths, clear out the underbrush of less meaningful and de-energizing activities, perhaps even renegotiating roles, commitments, or conversations in a different way, and building new habits and mindsets. 
And then finally, with that, we're in a position to reinvent. We will brainstorm and design together a future life and, and look at what that might look like. Set a vision, draft a plan, make choices about work and life, and develop strategies for centering, renewal, and staying the course. And as you progress, you might find that the level of effort and risk and commitment evolves too, and which is why we feel community is so important. Next slide. So we find that there's a progressive resetting of assumptions. And don't believe everything that your brain is telling you, because neuropsychology these days tells us that our thoughts change and they evolve. evolve. And we have about 70,000 thoughts going through our brain every day. A lot of them are negative. And so we're trying to, to balance that, get, move the negative out and balance out with some more positive reflections uh, as well. So we evolve from this all or none thinking. I either have to be there or I'm gone. I either have an identity or it's gone to learning specifically where we can maybe dial up and dial down and where we can leverage uh, our capabilities and our interests and go from thinking that you need to make big decisions to starting with small steps and experimenting and learning as you go along, revitalizing before reinventing. Our first reaction uh, may be that we need to figure this out on our own. You know, we're all, um, you know, highly capable, strong, resilient people. We do this on, on our own. But through the course, we, be, we can begin to recognize the power of safe and trusted community for this kind of work. And often we start with what's not working, at least in the medical world, we're really good at this, <laughs> what's not working. And, and you'd want your doctor to be doing this, to look for all the things that could go wrong. But at the same time, we actually need to look at what's working and how we can build on that and how we can savor those highs and learn from the lows and build on our inherent strengths. And then finally, we don't have to be paralyzed by the thought that we're just facing inevitable decline. We can learn about opportunity, what's possible, and, and what does lifelong learning and commitment uh, really look like for ourselves? Um, over to you, Russ. So, and, and, and I just put the, the smiley in the low, or, or the frowning, frowning in the lower left-hand corner, because, you know, one of the things that I think we found, Steph and I are both um, have had academic backgrounds, and it's very easy to write about this stuff or to talk about it, but the doing is a lot more, is a lot tougher than the description. And so one of the things I will say about the program is that, in fact, it is over eight sessions. Um, a lot of what happens is a working through of some of these issues over, over time in ways that become real um, for, for us o over time. So, um, so one of the things, you, you know, as Stephanie highlighted, we talked about this basic frame of reframe, revitalize, and reinvent. And in terms of revitalization, there's a core framework um, that we use in the, in the program, which is, is the compass. It's sort of, we talk about it as a NER compass that has four dimensions. And these come out of um, decades of research um, in psychology and lifespan development around a set of things that keep coming up if you look at the research on what makes uh, a good and thriving life. And um, that includes a sense of meaning and purpose and contribution, um, kind of, a, the, if you will, as a North Star, the power of relationships, you know, in fact, um, probably the single biggest predictor of, of longevity, in fact, is the quality of our relationships. Um, surprisingly, as, as strong as exercise and, and not smoking and everything else, um, again, our health in mind, body, and spirit, and then finally, a sense of joy and 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 delight in, in delight in life. Um, and part of the opportunity in the program is to really reflect on w where you are um, in all of these um, on all of these dimensions. And you know, it's it's something to think about. You know, almost, and you may want to think about this at this point in terms of you know, kind of red, yellow, green, right? And this is something, um, I actually have a copy, uh, I have a copy of this, you know, which I, I keep uh, near me and on a daily basis sort of think about red, yellow, green, you know, where where are things, you know, where am I on meaning and purpose? Um, how am I feeling about my relationships? 
uh, am I having some fun? Is there some fun in my life and health? And one of the things that Steph and I found is that particularly for folks who have been successful in their lives and professionals and work oriented, that there's often a tendency to um, particularly focus on the meaning and purpose piece and not necessarily have balance across the four of these or think about how a need for, for, for rebalancing. Um, and so part of what we uh, do in the program is both for people to assess, but then also to really think in a very action oriented way about, okay, what can I do right now to enhance my life and do that in a way that starts to explore the possibilities um, for what my next chapter might look like. And a lot of the work that people do is in fact around experimentation, testing out future options, um, exploring, you know, what, what might be, what, what might be possible. And we go um, quite deep into this. This is a more detailed rating um, evaluation of those dimensions. Um, all of the exercises in the, in the program are part of a, a guidebook that you people complete over the course of the uh, time that we have together so that you have a record and an ability to kind of follow um, your, your own progress. Another key thing that we find makes a huge difference is something Stephanie touched on before, which is just simply this notion of clearing out the underbrush. Um, that it's very hard to be focusing on the future, that there's so much sort of clutter and activities that are interesting things to do, but not necessarily things that are deeply energizing or meaningful. And just simply listing those and really asking yourself, how energizing do I find these activities and how meaningful are they? Sometimes there are things that may, you know, it's not necessarily, there may be things that aren't energizing, but we want to do them anyway because they're meaningful. But, there, but there's also a lot of clutter in our lives. And so um, what, how do we think about doubling down on the things that are most valuable for us um, and, and, and really clearing away some of those things that, that are not? Um, and then finally, as we think about reinventing, um, a lot of the work that we do in the program is a whole set of exercises that get you to a point of being able to answer five questions for yourself. Two, very simple, which is, you know, as I think about my future, this isn't just about change. What is it in my life that I want to preserve and build on? What is it that I hope would be different? Um, and another piece, which is a huge opportunity for folks, is to think about paths not taken in, in your life that you might want to more fully explore. For myself, I spent a lot of my career working um, in business and organizationally. But I started out as a psychologist and coming back for, for me, a path not taken is coming back to, to be doing this work, uh, which is very exciting and a wonderful opportunity for me. And it may be uh, for you as well that there that there are things that you thought, think about your past past life that this is an opportunity to be thinking about. What are the non-negotiables? I mean, the things that absolutely need to be there. And if you had no constraints, what would you be doing? And one of the things that we find in the program, I'll just highlight that is, and we encourage, is that these aren't just questions that you ask yourself, that um, it's a wonderful conversation to have with a significant other, um, to say not just what to you, but what do we want to preserve and build on? What would we hope would be different? What are our paths not taken? And so part of the exciting journey is not just an individual journey, but often it's a journey that, that, that we take on with others as well. So what's the promise of this program and, and why is it that Stephanie and I are so excited about it? Uh, I'll end with just a very simple quote from um, one of my favorite poets, Mary Oliver. So crafting your next chapter to answer the question once again, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? And it's an opportunity, I think, for all of us. And, and one would, both of us would look forward to, to sharing with you. So I think at this point, Seth, I think it's over to you. There you go. Good.
Great, and I will turn it over to Michelle to close us out and then we'll come to your questions. Michelle? Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Russ and Stephanie, for that amazing overview. Um, to all of you here in the audience with us today, if you are leaving this session as I am energized and excited about next steps, um, we would draw your attention to the application, which can be found on our website, which I've just put in the class or in the chat. Um, applications are now open. We'll be doing three rounds of acceptances. So the first will be going out next week, June 15th. There's certainly still time to apply. Um, there will be another round July 15th and then the final round on August 1st if there are still slots remaining. Um, so we encourage you to fill that out as quickly as you can. It is a very short application just to assuage any <laughs> fears that you might have about, you know, uploading transcripts or whatever. Um, we really just want to get a sense of who you are, what brings you to the program, and what you hope to take away from it. So it's quite a simple application. Um, please don't be intimidated by that. Um, as Russ and Stephanie stated in their overview of the course, the class will meet every other Tuesday from 3 to 5 p.m. Uh, from September 19th to December 12th. There will be one closing session on December 19th. And then our program cost is $2,995. If you would like to be considered for scholarship support, please do indicate that in your application. Uh, and a member of our team will follow up with you directly to assist. Awesome. All right. So now I would love to facilitate some questions for our instructors. I see the first one has come through in our chat here. So how many slots remain? Well, at this stage, all of them. Um, we have not yet issued any acceptances, so there's certainly plenty of time still to apply. The cohort will be limited just to keep, um, keep this a, a small group and really engage in productive discussion. Um, we'll have to just see, you know, what the mix looks like to ensure that we're able to preserve that productive space and a true group of peers for everyone. So it's really going to be dependent on, on who our applicants are and how that group comes together. Uh, but Seth, Russ, or Stephanie, if you have anything to add to that, please feel free. Just an encouragement. We have already received quite a few applications. And so if you are very interested in this, you know, we encourage you earlier because at this moment we anticipate it may fill uh, before the deadline that we originally put out for the final of August 1st. Um, I, I see some other uh, questions in the chat here. Um, this is online, so we want to make sure that you all feel comfortable with that technology. I mean, maybe one thing I can turn over, Stephanie and Russ, to you. I know one thing that you've really been focused on is building intimacy and connectivity, even in an online environment. And interestingly, even though your pilot of this came in a single institution, I believe that you actually have done this online with them for flexibility and, and you've been able to create really effective connectivity. And so I maybe can turn it over to you to just talk about how you approach that in the online space. Because I think that in a setting like this, intimacy and connectivity is so valuable and so people might wonder, is that possible, you know, in a Zoom setting? Mm -hmm. No, that's great. So um, we, we wondered that as well, honestly, when, <laughs> you know, we first taught the program and it was quite remarkable, actually, um, the degree to which there was a sense of community and connection um, that got created. One of the things we do in the program um, is to have people create um, a not just a professional bio, but actually a personal bio to share something about who they are, share pictures, you know, of the things that people care about in their lives. And what we find is that the group really comes together as a wonderful supportive community over time. Um, in fact, when we looked at the, the um, evaluations, people said, well, probably we love you, Russ and Steph, but actually what we really love is each other and the opportunity to be connecting to each other and learning from each other and hearing other people's experience and so on. And so it's it's remarkable how quickly the intimacy happens. Steph, anything you want to add? I've just run m many different types of groups through Zoom. And I think how you craft it and uh, allowing for space for people to connect and uh, and speak in, in different ways, both in a large group setting, but also in small group intimacy and, uh, and creating that safe container uh, has really uh, helped. And then you mentioned this, but do you just want to talk about what you do in that individual coaching session that you do with each person in the cohort? Mm-hmm. So uh, what we found, you know, um, 
it, with, with the physician group, they have very high expectations. And also, you know, you wonder, is the problem solved by the time eight weeks is done? And what we talk about is how this is a process, not, not only an endpoint. And so the coaching helps as we try to sort of peel the onion for individual uh, journeys and what people are, are working on. And for these, for our course at MGH, we uh, made it a, a, a voluntary part of the a course and what we found was that people really valued having that personal one-on-one -on -one, uh, connection in addition to the group setting and so for this course we're, we're actually integrating it into into the course to, um, architecture. Russ did you the want other to thing about that? yeah I, I think the other thing I want to say is our thought is to have that coaching session early because part of what we everybody has their own opportunities and issues and challenges that they're working through. And so what we really want to be doing is truly understanding each person in the program. That's why we are limiting this to, to 24 people in a way that we can help and support each person, not just in that coaching session, but throughout the whole semester. And, and frankly, come back at the end and say, look, have you made progress? Where are you? Where are you getting stuck? What's happening? Because it, it, this, is, this is both a collective journey, but it's also very much a personal journey. And so that feels uh, to us a pretty essential part of doing this kind of work. Absolutely. I see what I think might be an important question here in the chat from Michael. Is there a time, Russ and Stephanie, when it is too late to take this course? I don't think, no. <laughs> uh, we we I, I, don't think there's ever a time that where it's too late, so. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I look, look, I think I think there's a point. I mean, you know, we talked about five stages. I think there is a stage in life where people, you know, like my grandfather, Sam, where you really just want to sit on a rocking chair and it's really fine. And that's a perfectly reasonable place to be. <laughs> but, you know, I will point out that, you know, Picasso and, and all kinds of people were doing amazing stuff in their 80s and 90s and so on. So I don't think. I, I think it's more about where you are in your life and, and what it is that you're choosing to do. And, you know, since I think this is, frankly, I think so much of this is, as Seth said before about purpose, it's hard for me to imagine at, at any point in your life that you don't feel like having a larger purpose and contribution doesn't matter. And that's so much about what this program is about. So, um, mm -hmm. And I think feeling comfortable in a group setting. I mean, we do a lot of work to create a dynamic uh, and a safe container uh, for the group. Uh, but if you're someone who's not comfortable in a group setting uh, with this kind of course material, then uh, it, it would that that would be a, lim a limiting step. But yeah, I, 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 go for it. I want to build on Stephanie's comment because I do think there are a couple of things that are different about this program. I mean, it it's intentionally both a program about reflection, but also action, right? So, you, you know, you do exercises, but we really encourage you. It, the reason we meet every other week is because we want you to go out and try stuff and explore and talk to people and make things happen. It's, you know, it's a program um, very much about an in, in intellectual program in that there are a whole set of readings, but it's also a program about doing internal work. And so, you know, that's, that's what you're signing up for, right? I think that's the strength in the program, but it's important that people understand that our sense is the magic is in that integration of the intellectual and the, and, and, and the action oriented. But that's, you know, that's really what we're, we're talking about. Um, I see another question in the chat is about the time commitment. Um, I know the two hours every other week, but can you speak to, you know, what size homework you're giving the students? And I imagine some of this is just integrated with their lives in terms of reflection, but in terms of the reading or other, you know, more uh, specific materials that you might expect people to go through. Mm -hmm. Russ? So, you know, typically they'll, for each session, there'll be a self-reflective exercise, and I think probably that's you know 
half an hour to an hour to really to, to make the time and really reflect on that. I think you may want to take more than that. There's an opportunity, as I said before, people find it really powerful to share that with a significant other and talk about it. So there's an opportunity to do more. And then typically we would provide a reading. Um, but, you know, typically that's a chapter. It's not a book. Um, one of the things, the challenges we had at the Mass General is you have physicians who are scheduled 70 hours a week. And so clearing the space of the time and energy was, was an enormous challenge for people. So I, I would say probably um, maybe an hour or two between the sessions, but I think you may want to spend more than that just because as, as Seth, you said, you know, those are, it's really, it's your life, you know, it's an opportunity to integrate things into that, but it's not, it's not huge heavy lifting. It's not like being an undergraduate, you know, where you're going, getting back into the coal mines again. Or in our world, all nighters where you, you've got a memorable, <laughs> but I think we, our pilot was with very busy people. And so, and, and not, a, a group, uh, it was not a group that was um, uncomfortable giving us feedback about how, you know, what <laughs> their, their time commitments and such. But what we did feel was that there's a commitment to just being there and being present and, uh, you know, showing up because you're part of a group. And, and, and as you get deeper into the course, you're making connections with the group. So that commitment uh, was important, just being able to set aside the time and show up for the course. And then the, the work we modified based on uh, what we learned uh, from this busy group. Uh, another question that's come in relates to uh, what you're looking for, and we're going to be in the selection process with you, so maybe I'll take a first stab at this, in the applications and the CV. And um, I'll share a few thoughts that we've talked about, but then I'll turn over Russ and Stephanie to you. So one of the hallmarks of these programs is that you learn from one another as well as uh, Russ and Stephanie. And so, you know, the aim of the selection process is to find a group of people that will really be co-creators in that classroom. And through their insight, they will help others to better discern their own next chapter. So on the essay side, you know, we're really looking for people that are reflective, that uh, show vulnerability, because so much of this is about letting that armor down. You know, during that professional or uh, midlife, you're kind of building armor and you're taking on a certain identity. And then when you no longer have that title, that identity may no longer fit, but you may not know who you are, right? And uh, you may still feel like putting on that armor every day. And so long way of saying, how do we see in those essays that real recognition that this is a time of opportunity, but also your honesty about what may be challenging or because the more honest you are, the more we know that in that room, you're gonna help others open up and you're gonna create this space where everyone can really begin to discern and to discover together. Uh, in terms of the CV, um, this is not, I want to say, um, the same application process you went through, you know, for your undergraduate or graduate education. Uh, we do not believe, you know, to reflect in the next chapter, you need an X uh, GPA or, you know, a Y a specific experience. We are aiming for people that have a significant level of experience. Um, it may be professionally, it may also be in life. We know, you know, a number of people may be at a point where um, their kids have left and they kind of took off to do uh, parenting, and now they're in a place where they're discerning that next chapter as well, but they're able to share kind of what were those experiences over those years, how did those shape them, and so it's really about kind of showing that arc, and then allowing us, as we put together the cohort, to really build a diverse group that has different lived experiences so that you can learn from one another, because so much of this is comparing in the room well, here are the, some of the things that I value. Here are the, some of the things I've learned about myself. And the more you have different experiences in that room, the more you'll be able to have that kind of co-creation. And Russ and Stephanie, let me turn it over to you for additions. Yeah. Russ? No, I, I, I no, no. You said it well. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you hit the ball. So, so Seth, what I would, the, the only, I thought you, you hit the ball out of the park on that one. Um, the only thing I would add is that, you know, it, part of this is it's a little bit like, you know, having a great party, right, where you want to have a set of people who are complimentary and, and really 
And so part of this will just be, I think, you know, my sense is both enough difference in the group, but also a sense that there are going to be other people who you recognize and feel like are fellow travelers. And so, you know, we think about different sort of diversity around life stages, some people maybe who are still working, some people who, you know, have left full-time employment, some people who are right in the middle, some people from business, if people are in the professions. And, you know, you kind of want to have not just one, but two or three, but you, so it's both diversity and so that you feel like, you know, gosh, there's some people I could really have been really can understand my pain and, and my joy because they've been where I've been, but also some other people were quite different that I could be learning from. That's really, I think it's sort of the heart, the heart of what um, we're hoping is going to happen. Yeah, and that's and that's what we, we we did strive for with even with the MGH group, even though everybody was working for the same institution, there was quite a lot of diversity in terms of ex both work and life experiences. Well, I know we are at time, and I believe we have actually accomplished uh, the question. So I will put in the chat uh, Michelle Libby's contact because she is our point person, although. Uh, Russ, Stephanie, and I are all also very available uh, through Michelle if anyone has questions for us as a follow-up. Um, let me just say how joyful it is to be in the virtual room with all of you. Um, my favorite aspect of this work is to, I mean, really be with people that are thinking about how do we build purpose in this chapter of life that kind of our broad uh, generation has been gifted with, and how do we use it in a way that really matters? And so. Um, thank you all for being here and for even having the initiative to say, I want to be part of something really meaningful in this next chapter. And Russ and Stephanie, let me just say a huge thank you. This is so fortuitous. Russ and I have known each other for nearly a decade, yeah. and I've admired Russ's work over that time. And when we realized that we were in the same world yeah. suddenly of leadership later in life and how do you kind of build these encore chapters, uh, we were so excited to find a way to collaborate and bring a new format to this series of programs. So just a joy to be with you and Stephanie and Michelle, thank you for managing all of it and uh, making it all so exciting as we come to the cohort. I will just say, or I see one more question that was not answered. I'll end with, this is the beginning, uh, not the end. So our hope is to have a cohort like this each year. And then it is possible. We really wanna let this play out. LSI is starting its first year, and then we're gonna be deciding what next, that there could be an in-person version of this that would likely be condensed. So instead of having this be, you know, over a long time horizon, it would be possible for people to come, for example, for a week and try to construct this over a, a shorter but meaningful period. So those are all in the realm of possibilities, but um, all in this stage of experimentation uh, still to be decided. Uh, thank you, and uh, looking forward to uh, hopefully seeing all of you as we continue the conversation about what purpose later in life looks like. Have good afternoons. Thank you.